Chapter 2, Part 2, American Experiments. We're talking about the different types of colonies. And we left off with Neo-European colonies. Um, so the Neo-European colonies, they replicated or duplicated what they were used to back in Europe. So places like New England, New York, New Amsterdam, New France, New Netherlands were all named after cities and countries back in Europe. These people came in and they simply copied the social and economic systems that they were used to. So New France is an example of a Neo-European colony. So looking at this map, it's a little misleading. It looks like, like France has all the land and all the power, and not, not entirely the, the case. So looking at, let's look at the English here first in the red. This is the, the area with the, that would become, the, or became, the 13 original English colonies. Uh, understand, there's a mountain chain right here, that, the Appalachians, that really somewhat holds them hemmed in against the coast. They weren't able to spread out and 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 settle and, and you know thin themselves out. So they were they were like sardines. There's a lot of people in this in this small area. Okay. Now you see this large amount of land up here is also English, but all this was 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 trapping and hunting and fishing rights from Hudson Bay. The Hudson Bay Company uh you know managed to wrangle that and, and get that for the English. But there's hardly anybody up there. It's English land, but it's it's just a, a, a handful of trappers. Uh, so similarly with the French, you have all this blue land is the French, but but most most of it was just along the St. Lawrence River here. So they dropped down to upstate New York and and part of Canada, but mostly their their population centered around around this area. They are also uh, Louisburg and Port Royal out here in the coast, but for the most part along this river. But what's important about that is it gave them access. This river gave them access to the Great Lakes. Give them access to the Ohio River, to the Mississippi, and then all the way to New Orleans. So even though the French also were sparsely populated, there wasn't very many people there at all. Uh, the, the English uh, far, you know, had far more people in that small piece of red than the French did. Okay, uh, but an example of a <clears throat> neo-European colony. So let's do a supplemental lecture right here. Continue on with the French, and we'll talk about the French and natives, okay? Uh, so we're talking about, what this is about is I'm, 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 I'm using the French as an example of a different type of relationship with the natives and other powers had. But looking at our, our outline introduction, the French were fur trappers, they were the early European explorers. Number two, colonial relations with the natives. So we're gonna tell me about the English, tell me about the Spanish. So we already know about those for the most part. We've gone over that, you know, uh, in, in, in detail. Uh, but, then, but then the French. So how are the French different than the other two? And give me details about why they were different or how they're different, I'm sorry. And then tell me why they were different. And I, I will prompt you in the lecture that that's what I'm talking about, okay? And then of course the relevance. So back to our map here, uh, the French colony was called New France, but most of the population was northern New York or upstate New York and, and over the river into Canada. And, and the, the French came and they were mostly fur trappers and they worked the beaver trade. Well, what was important about that? The beaver pelts were very, very popular because they were used to manufacture men's hats back in Europe and every man wanted a, a beaver hat from the New World. So the French came for beavers, and they found a huge market there. Uh, and they, with the natives, they immediately began to trade with the natives for pelts. But right off the bat, they didn't assault them or attack them or, or you know, uh, abuse them. They were friendly, uh, and uh, they right up right from the very beginning, the French established a good relations with the with the natives. So a consequence of the fur trade by these fur trappers from France was exploration deep into unknown territory. These men went, went deep into the lands and found lakes and rivers, mountain chains. They found different tribes and they came back with maps, however crude, but for the first time, European people began to understand what was out there. No white European had ever been there before. So the French fur trappers truly were the first explorers of the New World. So as the Europeans came, there, there were hostilities 
between the colonists and the natives right away for obvious reasons. The native lands were being encroached upon. Uh, we're all dying from disease. Your white civilization is spreading like a weed. So you have, you have conflict. So how do the European powers of the, of the New World treat the Native Americans? Well, we've talked about the English and the natives before. They had a horrible relationship with the natives. They treated them as inferior. They believed they stood in the way of their God-given right to the land in America. Remember, manifest destiny. God has ordained us. You're in our way. You could say that the English despised them. They wanted to subject the natives to their laws as they established their colonies. They wanted them to adopt their ways, their language, their religion. But they also wanted to exterminate them, remove them from the picture. And we will learn this class how they did that. We've, we've talked about kind of the start of it. We'll see how it continues. So what about the Spanish? Well, we learned about them too with uh, the conquistadors and you know the, the defeat of the Aztecs through disease. Uh, but they didn't have any better relationship than natives either. They enslaved them when they first came to America. Uh, Spain would be in, would be dominant in Mexico and South America for 300 years after Hernan Cortez, and and they treated the Mexican and and, and Mesoamerican and South American people very very horribly. Uh, later, when the Spanish came north into California to establish the missions, we we, we learned this. They the natives around the Missions were forced to convert from their traditional religions to Catholicism and, again, treated cruelly and enslaved, subjugated. And the natives did not appreciate any of this. So two European countries that were largely ethnocentric in their approach to different people that were not like them, our way or the highway, become like us or we're going to crush you. But what about the French? So the French were a notable exception to this. The French were benevolent to the Indians. Uh, they enjoyed excellent relations with the natives almost from the very beginning. So why were the French different? There's our why in the outline, okay? So I want you to give me details of all the things I tell you here. Uh, why they were different? They did not try to change the natives. They did not compete with them for land. They recognized that native culture was diverse. Most European powers saw non-white peoples of, of any type as all the same. All, all Africans are the same. All Native Americans are the same. All Asians are the same. Well, wherever they ran into, the, into people that weren't like them, they saw them as all the same. The French recognized that they were diverse like anybody else. So the French became the, the only European power to try to understand native culture and ways. So when they first came to the Americas in 1530s and 1540s, because, because of this benevolence, when they came for fur trapping, they immediately established strong trading ties with the local natives they found there, who already dealt extensively in furs. So of course, that's, a, that's a fortuitous for the French. They, they already find a, a partner that knows the land and knows where the furs are at. So it, it was a, it was a advantageous um, relationship for them too. A man named Giovanni de Verrazzano, actually an Italian explorer who worked for the French king. So if you if you are from New York City and you've been there, Verrazzano Narrows, Verrazzano Bridge, named after this man. <clears throat> so although an Italian explorer, he worked for the French king, he charted the Atlantic coast of North America between the Carolinas and Newfoundland. He was the first one to do it. And including New York Harbor in 1524. So going back to uh, chapter one, we, we, we read some quotes from Columbus about the Tainos and the Arawaks, where initially he was kind and, and praised them, but by the end of it, he saw the opportunity to, to take advantage of them. And then his second quote, he, he despises them. They're cannibals. They drink blood. They, they have dog-like noses. They're, they're, they're horrible people. So just as a comparison, here's a couple of quotes from Verrazzano, and you see the difference. They exceed us in size, and they are of a very fair complexion. <clears throat> Some incline more to a white, and others to a tawny color. Their faces are sharp, and their hair long and black, upon the adorning of which they bestow great pains. Their eyes are black and sharp, their expressions mild and pleasant, greatly resembling the antique. In a letter to the king of France, Verrazano wrote that the Narragansett tribe 
are the most beautiful and have the most civil customs that we have found on this on this voyage. So from the very beginning, the French were not threatened by the natives and vice versa. Neither one saw the other as an enemy. They saw each other as friends, partners. <laughs> so the, the, the natives taught the French how to trap and how to be successful in the fur trade. Uh, and they became partners. So what's what's important about that is the French could leave for the winter and go back to France and leave all their belongings and settlements and tools and you know all the tools of their trade with the natives and not get ripped off. If they hadn't had friendly relations with the natives, they'd have to they'd have to take all that back with them. They could leave everything the way it was, go home for the winter, come back and and, and trap in the spring and summer. <clears throat> Uh, but they'd go home with ships full of furs, and they made lots of money. So they, they did very, very well. And the French traded the, the natives' European wares also, metal cooking pots, weapons, you know, other goods that were not accessible to the natives at that time. But most importantly, horses. I mentioned this before. Horses were brought by the Europeans. They weren't here before that. <clears throat> horses dramatically changed the lives of the natives, made them better hunters, more effective in battles, they could travel farther, they could set up new trade opportunities. <clears throat> so the French accompanied the natives on their hunting parties, uh, and they were shown where the where the good fur animals could be found. So the French made it a point to learn the native languages and customs. And the English and Spanish wanted them to forget them, but the French learned the native customs. <clears throat> My voice is going here again. <clears throat> So their relationship was based on equality with all the tribes in the area. Even the king, King Louis XIII, in the Ordinance of 1627, claimed that natives who had converted to Catholicism, so again, the, the, the French were still white Europeans whose all their intent was to convert to the people of Christianity. But the king says, become a Catholic, and I will consider you as a natural Frenchman, and you have the same rights as a French citizen. So understand, this is the direct opposite of how the English and Spanish the natives. They would never consider allowing them to integrate into their societies. In, in their mind, they were inferior. Uh, they should remain in a subservient role, enslaved or removed and exterminated. When the French established the permanent settlement at Quebec in 1608, this is one year after the English founded Jamestown in Virginia, they did not displace any natives in the establishment of it. So we remember in Jamestown, once they found tobacco, they started taking up all the land and pushing the natives out. The, the French didn't do that. They didn't displace anybody, <clears throat> okay? Uh, <clears throat> they continued to work closely with them in the fur trade. They respected the native territories, their ways, and they treated them as human beings. In turn, the Indians trusted the French's trusted friends, they, and they had this great relationship. The French were the only uh, European power that tried to alleviate the diseases that the natives were experiencing because of contact with the early European explorers. The English and Spanish were happy to watch them die. The French tried to help them. Uh, more intermarriages took place <clears throat> between the French and the natives than any other European group. Uh, and this, these alliances were, were based on mutual respect and good treatment um, from both sides. Uh, many, fr many French trappers had two families, <clears throat> one with his white wife in France, where he'd go for the winter, and he'd come back and he'd have his native wife in America, each, each many times included children in a family. Uh, I doubt that either wife knew about the other, but this, this was the way of a, of a French trapper. So without question, the natives had their best relationship with the French compared to the other white European people that came to the New World. Why were they different? There's the why of your of your uh, outline. So going back to this, who they were, they were they were fur trappers, not farmers. They weren't interested in farms and plantations like the English, uh, the, because the geography is different. So you're up in you're up in upstate New York and Canada. It's cold in the winter. It's hilly, stony, <clears throat> there's lots of waterways, but not conducive for large-scale farming like the South, where you've got this, <clears throat> this, this open flat land with nutrients from the rivers, you've got a, 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 a mild winter, uh, completely different. So they weren't as motivated to create huge settlements like the English were. 
Agriculture leads to settlement and organization and a hierarchy is the result. Uh, plantation uh, farming, that, that type of society, it needs people to work the land. And of course, we know that those people were typically slaves. But fur trapping is different. Fur trapping is more of a singular trade. A fur trapper didn't need to rely on anyone. It didn't require a large settlement to do his, his trade, okay? Okay, the relevance of this lecture, because of their friendly relationship, relations with the French, most of the natives sided with them during the four French and Indian Wars and even got the numbers for the French. One more time, relevance. Because of their friendly relations with the French, most of the natives sided with them during the four French and Indian Wars and even got the numbers for the French. Okay, so the French and Indian Wars are coming. We haven't got there yet, but I said before that the French had a lot of, a lot of the strategic land, but not a lot of people. Uh, the, the English had more people. So again, because of their good relations with the French, many natives sided with them, which even got the numbers during that war, okay? So that is the end of supplemental lecture number three, the, the French and, and natives, okay? Let's keep going here. Uh, so back to colonization. So the French lands were remote, as I said, sparsely populated. <clears throat> Even today, like then, Canada was huge and vast. Uh, to this day, most of the population of, of Canada consists of a couple hundred miles above the United States border. So most of it's along the St. Lawrence River from way back in those days. But even today, most of the larger cities are just over the border of the United States, Edmonton, Vancouver, Regina, uh, Winnipeg, and so on. Up in here, it's very remote, but it's freezing cold. It, it's, it's almost uninhabitable for large groups of people. So even though Canada is a large country even today, it's still got a low population, and it wasn't any different then, okay? Uh, so the colonial period in Canada began when the first permanent settlements were established in Montreal, Quebec, and you see these uh, along the St. Lawrence River, and then out on the coast here, uh, you, you have cities, uh, Port Royal, Louisbourg. All these were neo-European colonies. Uh, but perfect land for fur trapping. So there's our river again. There's the St. Lawrence River, as I mentioned. You come in from the Atlantic, and you can get all the way to the interior, all the way to the Great Lakes, just by following this one river. So very strategic. Uh, okay. Um, I lost my spot here. Okay, so the St. Lawrence River, Atlantic, brought you deep, deep into the interior of the Americas. Uh, 1535, the French explorer Jacques Cartier, the first European to find the river, not discovered, to fi find it. And what do you think he was doing there? He was seeking a northwest passage to China. That darn Marco Polo started a frenzy. So, so the river, the St. Lawrence River, became the main route into the interior for the early explorers. It became the center of New France, and it figured prominently in Canada's early history. But even today, the river remains the focus of settlement for much of the province of Quebec and still is the most important commercial waterway in Canada, as well as a source of electric power for today. Okay, back, in, back into our era. Another power at that time were the Dutch. They became very dominant. The Dutch, New Netherland, gained power in the early 1600s. So we don't hear much about them in, in United States colonial history or, or American colonial history. We hear about the Spanish and the English and the French, but not the Dutch, but they were they were players also. In the early 1600s, so very early on in the, in the, in the colonial era, they gained control of much of the commerce going on in the, in, in the colonies. They cornered the market in slaves and crops and plantations, spices from Asia. They became a dominant force in the fur trade and they seized control. Their, their colony was uh, uh, includes today what would be New York and Manhattan Island, uh, but they began to confiscate lands from the Native Americans, take their lands like the English were doing. Uh, but but the natives fought back, and this resulted in a ruinous war for the Indians. The Dutch slaughtered them, but while the Dutch were focused on fighting the natives, the English saw their chance and attacked and invaded them, and and they and they. 
uh, went into wars, wars called the Anglo-Dutch War. This is the English versus the Dutch. Uh, the English defeated the Dutch, and New Netherlands became New York, and New Amsterdam became New York City, okay? Uh, so we talked about the Iroquois Confederacy, that, uh, that confederacy of five tribes, later six, it was brought together in solidarity by Hiawatha. So they were large compared to any, any other tribe, but also weakened by disease and then defeated by France. So now, now wait a minute, didn't, didn't I say that the French were liked by the natives? Well, I said most of the native tribes were friendly with the French. The Iroquois was the exception. The Iroquois were always motivated to gain their own strength, regardless of any association with the Europeans. Okay. Um, so in this era, uh, they come into conflict with the with the French, and they go into what were called the Beaver Wars or the French and Iroquois Wars. These these are wars uh, over the control of the, of the beaver trade. Uh, so. Looking at the image here, the little cute little guy on the left shooting the bazooka, I've been told by a student that that's not a beaver, that's probably a chipmunk. So I searched high and low for a picture of a beaver shooting a, a bazooka, and I couldn't find one. So I just kept it as symbolic. You, you, you get the idea, okay? So these, these beaver wars were fought in the 17th century, a series of conflicts between the French and Iroquois. The Iroquois wanted to expand their territory and take control of the role of the middleman in the fur trade between the French and the tribes of the West. They wanted their piece of the action. So the Beaver Wars pitted the nations of the Iroquois Confederation, led by the dominant Mohawk tribe, against the largely Algonquin tribes of the area and their French allies. <clears throat> uh, these wars were ones of extreme brutality on both sides and considered one of the bloodiest series of conflicts in the history of North America. And, and one that we, we just don't hear about. You don't, you don't learn this in high school. But a significant battle because it, it resulted in, you know, in, a, in a shift in power because the Iroquois were defeated and the French gained a foothold uh, further in the fur trade. Uh, but the Iroquois came back pretty quickly, not right away, but pretty quickly. They, they gained strength because of their numbers and their solidarity. So defeated by war, uh, diminished by disease, but like everybody else, but because they were so large, they came back quicker. And they, and they came to be a dominant power again. They would come to dominate upstate New York and later would become English allies and play important roles uh, in the French and Indian Wars and in the American Revolution that we're heading towards in our class here. <clears throat> Okay, so back to English colonization. So we talked about they gained uh, confidence, they came over, they had some failures, but they're still you know, interested in colonizing. So of course the most famous of the English uh, colonizers were the Pilgrims. 1620, this group of people coming to escape religious persecution. So we talked about Jamestown and that those people really weren't about that, they were more about business and making money and finding gold in the ground. Uh, yeah, many people believe that all the colonies that started in the Americas, what would become the United States, came to escape religious persecution. Some did, some didn't. So it wasn't just all about that. Okay, But in this case, it is. They want to get away from the persecution of Europe. The pilgrims called themselves separatists. They left the Church of England. They, they, didn't, they weren't happy with it anymore. They wanted to be separate from main society also. They wanted to be left alone to practice their religion. Now, these people came, were much more prepared than the colonists at Jamestown, okay? Uh, and, they, and, and they came to Virginia. So the group that set out from Plymouth, initially from southwestern England in 1620, it wasn't just all pilgrims. There were, there were 35 members of a radical Puritan faction known as the English Separatist Church. So the Mayflower wasn't just all pilgrims. You had a ship full of people that had dissenting point of views about religion. So that's going to be an important aspect of our story here in a, in a few minutes, okay? <clears throat> so they came to Virginia and landed on Plymouth Rock. And that's what we've heard, right? So so what is Plymouth Rock? I mean, my, my uh, conception of Plymouth Rock had always been 
But as they approached the coastline and came closer to it, they were attracted by a geographical formation that I assume was a large rock. And that's where they landed. And they stepped out on Plymouth Rock very famously and started the Plymouth Colony. But that's not entirely true. So let me tell you a story about Plymouth Rock. So probably 30 years ago, it might be longer, I hate to say, um, I was in Boston and I decided to drive down to Cape Cod, a very beautiful part of the country without question. And on the drive to Cape Cod, you drive through Plymouth. It's on the coast there. So I thought, well, cool, I can, I can go see Plymouth Rock here. Because, I mean, who would want to do that, right? <laughs> so I'm driving down the coast. I can see the coast for miles ahead of me. I'm looking for this rock formation. I don't see anything. So I finally pull into Plymouth. I don't see anything. I'm on the coast. The, 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 the ocean's right there. Uh, <clears throat> as I'm driving through downtown, I see a group of people milling around this structure. The structure was a roof with no walls. Just had like posts holding up this roof, and around the post was a was an iron kind of rail, like a fence. Okay, and all these people were were looking over the rail down at something. So I thought, okay, I better check that out. So I so I pull over, and on my way over to this structure, I see a ranger, and I asked her, "Where's Plymouth Rock?" And she started laughing at me, I'm like, "Why are you laughing at me?" Like. I can't imagine that people don't come from miles around to see Plymouth Rock. It's a famous part of American history. What's going on? She said, well, it's not really true. It, it, it was made up. It was made up to, to attract people to come to Plymouth. So it turns out at the turn of the 20th century, the people of Plymouth decided to create this whole idea about Plymouth Rock. They took a backhoe out into the hills behind the city, dug around, they found this big rock. And they dug it out of the ground, they, they chiseled 1620 on it, and they decided to put it in this enclosure. This, this is that, that, that structure with the roof I'm talking about. They put it in there for tourists to come and look at. Unfortunately, they dropped it when they were, when they were putting it down, and it cracked it. And at first, they thought, we better get another rock. But then they thought, you know, that crack makes it look even older. So here's a picture of the actual Plymouth Rock. On the on the right there, mm -hmm. you can't really get an idea of how large that is. Now I don't know about you, but I thought Plymouth Rock was huge. I mean, it's like you know, a monster rock. This rock would fit in anybody's living room. Okay, this is the rock that that the pilgrim supposedly stepped out on. Now I'm going to tell you as an historian, and I do research, and I only use primary sources to create my arguments. Right? I have I have gone over extensively. Pilgrim primary sources, and there's nowhere that says anything about stepping out on a rock. So this whole idea was kind of made up to create a mythology and, and a nationalism about America. Okay, um, this this rock is not quite what you what you would think it would be. Okay, so just for fun, let's watch this film entitled Plymouth Rock: Drive Through History. Uh, so the, the the guy in the film, you know, thinks he's pretty funny. He's not that funny, but I'm not so interested on you focusing on him what i want you to do is is get a look at at what he's looking down on this is what i saw from the street and you see the rail he's leaning against it so the rock is, is like below they, they dug dug down 10 feet below you look down on it okay you, you can kind of see a better idea of what i'm talking about and then also get an idea of how small this rock this rock really is so go ahead and watch that film okay so so this whole thing is a farce. So there you see the big crack in the in the in the rock when they dropped it, 1620. Somebody, of course, learned this and jumped inside and wrote lies on it. Now that wasn't me, by the way, although it occurred to me. I have to say I wasn't very happy to learn this many years ago. But this is history. This is the way history is. You know, a, a lot of the you know fables and and legends aren't aren't entirely true. And we're going to talk about a number of those in this class. Okay, so I mentioned that the, that the people that came over in the Mayflower, some were Puritans, most were pilgrims. You have this a little bit of a conflict. They don't believe in the same things. Uh, this is important because uh, it has to do with the writing of what's what was called the Mayflower Compact. So out of the, as far as the pilgrims go, this might be the most important thing to understand as far as their relevance to American history. Uh, they, they wrote this compact while they were still offshore. And before they came on land for the first time. So, so what was the Mayflower conflict? Compact. Sorry. 
It was a legal instrument that bound the Pilgrims and the Puritans together when they arrived in New England. So again, the core members were separatist Pilgrims, uh, but others in the group remained part of the Church of England, the Puritans. Uh, so not all the travelers shared the same religion. So they determined in order to maintain order and establish a civil society in this, in this new colony that we don't know anything about, on November 11, 1620, the adult male pastors signed this Mayflower Compact that bound them together, even though they were different. Okay, this is an amazing moment uh, in, of course, the history of equality and, of course, where America would become. So uh, a couple hundred years later, so understand I'm jumping ahead, but I, I want to give you a quote from a famous person about the Mayflower Compact. This is a quote from John Quincy Adams, the, uh, the president in 1802, the sixth president. He described the Mayfla Mayflower Compact as the only instance in human history of that positive, original, social compact. So the, the Mayflower Compact influenced the Declaration of Independence, and the U.S. Constitution to govern themselves. This, this influenced the, the, the founding fathers that developed a new government that had never been seen before. And we're talking about the first democratic government established in America. So the, so, so the Mayflower Compact wasn't the first democratic government established in America. The United States government was, but the United States government was influenced by the Mayflower Compact. And the other group that came to escape religious persecution was the Puritans. So the difference with them is they didn't want to separate from the Church of England. They wanted to stay in it, but they wanted to purify it. They wanted to make it the way that they wanted it. Mm -hmm. so they start the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Very strict, very harsh. Fire and brimstone, you know, people had to repent for their sins. A very fearful religion, a, a, a religion that feared God. And run by a, a man named John Winthrop, the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So Puritanism may be defined by the intensity of the religious experience that it created. They believed that it was necessary to be in a covenant relationship with God. So, so what's a covenant? A formal, solemn, and binding agreement. Uh, much like the Mayflower Compact. Uh, the Puritans want to redeem themselves from one sinful condition. This was the most important part of their lives, uh, to please God and be humble and, and um, you know, uh, not arrogant, um, uh, be reserved. Uh, the Puritans believed that God had chosen to re reveal salvation through preaching and that the Holy Spirit was the energizing instrument of salvation. And they came up with this idea called a city upon a hill. Let's read the quote here. For we must consider that we shall be a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through through the world. Uh so this is a th that that's a lot to take on. The, the eyes of all people are upon us. So so Winthrop's saying that the the entirety of the world is watching us because we are the shining example of a Christian society and and that that's that's right and righteous and virtuous and 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 we are the people. So again, ordained by God, God's favorite people. This is who we are. Nobody can touch us. Very ethnocentric. Okay, let's watch a couple of short films back to back here. So the first one is is called Where and When Does America Begin? Okay, um, this was put together by a professor from Washington University uh, in St. Louis with the help of some of his students. Uh, so this, this idea of a city upon a hill has become an American icon. So please watch that film and then come on back. Okay, so the idea of the city upon a hill has been used by many politicians in their speech speeches, from John Kennedy to Robert Kennedy to Ronald Reagan to Hillary Clinton, uh, to, to use to emphasize their, their love for America and their nationalism. Uh, Ronald Reagan used it in his farewell speech as he left the presidency. So let's watch the next film. Please watch the film, Shining City Upon a Hill, Reagan's speech, okay? 
So again, an, an iconic American ideal, a city upon a hill that we still hear about all the time. But did it fit for non-white people? Not for Native Americans, that land that your city upon a hill is built on was taken from us. Not for African Americans, we toil in the field so you can build a city upon a hill that we can take no part in. But what about white women? Uh, they toil in the shadows of men with little thanks or appreciation and uh, a lack of respect, forced to be subservient and do what the man's bidding was. Uh, so this this is the true the, the truth behind who the Puritans were. Okay, contradictory, you know, virtuous on the one end and 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 uh, you know unabashedly cruel on the other. And and they they were very cruel to the Native Americans. So so what is this ideal of this perfect society, the city upon a hill, which of course became Boston, by the way? Um, what is this ideal really founded on? Well, it was the belief that the Puritans had of what's called predestination. <clears throat> so what is that? It's the idea that all the people who will make it into heaven have already been chosen by God in the beginning of time. That means that not everybody can make it into heaven. And in fact, um, he's already chosen them. Uh, God only saves a few people, and these people were called the elect. So of course, people were stressing out here. Well, wait a minute. How do we know if we're if we're one or not? They be, they became very worried about this. <coughs> Excuse me. They 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 began to believe in this idea. So they they're I mentioned this before. Human beings rationalize when they can't figure something out. When there's no obvious answer, they come up with a rational explanation. They they began to believe that they had to work hard to achieve to please God in hopes of being included. And if they did that, if they led these lives that was full of hard work and ambition and you know frugality and honesty and asceticism, asceticism is the avoidance of indulgence. If they lived that type of life, they would have to be considered one of God's elect, even though the truth is they never really knew. But what came out of this is what was called the Protestant work ethic based on this idea of predestination. And we still live like that today in America. The, the Puritans have been gone for hundreds of years, but what we still have in America, the United States today, we still have that need to push ourselves, to, to, to work hard. You know, European uh, people take a month off for holiday in the, in the, every year. Uh, Mexican people take siestas for a couple hours a day. Americans work overtime. America's, Americans skip their their vacation pay to get paid double and work through their vacation hours. It's all about getting ahead and, and money. Uh, Americans are somewhat obsessed with it. It really does begin with this Puritan work ethic that came out of this fear of not being one of the elect. Okay, back to our colonies. So as the colonies start to uh, establish and do well, we come up with joint stock corporations. So what is that? Well, it, it's a corporation that would fund uh, colonies. So investors would contribute capital and then receive return share of stock of the colony. So many colonies were financed this way instead of relying on the inhabitants. So we saw Roanoke, we, didn't, we don't even know what happened to them. They were left to their own devices and, and we don't know what happened. Jamestown came very close to failing and there was no money to bail them out. So a joint stock corporation was there to finance them when they were having hard times to keep it going. So a joint stock corporation is clearly the forerunner of the modern corporation. This is the start of the modern corporation. In a modern corporation today, typically stock is sold to investors. Investors provide capital and you have some limited risk, but the risk is usually small and the returns were fairly quick but also not not a huge return. It's it's safe investing. Of course, there's 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 you know, stocks and that have much more risk. But typically, the, a modern you know trader has limited risk. But investing in the colony in those days was an altogether different venture. Uh, the risk was much larger as so the colony could fail, and we have evidence of that. Roanoke and uh, almost Jamestown. The startup costs for a colony were enormous. And of course, to continue to support them until they could get on their feet was also costly. 
the returns might take years, so investors had a much higher risk. So these investors needed more than a small sense of adventure to invest. They needed to be wealthy enough, enough to absorb a complete loss if they had to. But if they were lucky enough for that colony to, to survive and, and do well, they were going to make a ton of money. The, the, the returns would be huge, okay? <clears throat> so I mentioned the Puritans, that they were harsh and strict, and you had to follow the, their, their laws, and it was all about you know, their harsh religion. But not everybody goes along with that, and you have what's called a dissident. So, so, so a dissident is a people that break away from the norm, you stand out. You break away from the strictness of the, of the Puritan church. So what's a dissident? A person who opposes official policy, especially that of an authoritarian state. It is a person who does not always follow the status quo and does not always follow along with what everyone else is doing. But this is a, these are people that fight back against the harshness of the Puritans. And Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson are, are two examples. So Roger Williams is a Puritan man who started to push for toleration. Toleration of what? To allow people to practice other religions in the in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, not be so strict about just simply being a Puritan. This is the way Europe was. We're supposed to be different over here. Okay. So Williams pushes for that, but he also protested the abuses towards Native Americans that the Puritans were were inflicting. So again, a pious, moral people uh, on the one hand, and and absolutely vicious killers on the other. Okay, so this didn't sit well with Roger Williams, and he wants to change things, but this did not go well with the Puritan authorities, and they threw him out. So Roger Williams, a dissident, but that was thrown out. He would he would travel to Providence, Rhode Island, and start a colony there. Uh, Anne Hutchinson was another dissident, also thrown out for her views. But she had it worse because she was a woman, and a woman shouldn't speak up in public like she was doing. So also scorned because she was a woman and labeled a heretic. There's that word again. A heretic maintained religious opinions contrary to those accepted by the Puritan church. She was exiled to Rhode Island also and followed Williams. They later started a colony that was that was known for their toleration and more of an of a of a colony that was that was based on equality as opposed to the Puritans. Okay. Uh, another moment of the Puritans is the Salem witch trials. Um, so what happened in Salem, Massachusetts? Um, you have these witch trials. So this is where the term witch hunt came from. You go on a witch hunt. So back in Salem, some of the young girls that lived there started accusing other young girls of being witches. And the community overreacted and believed it. And they went on a hunt to find young female witches. And the Salem witch trials occurred in colonial Massachusetts. Between 1692 and 1693, more than 200 people were accused of practicing witchcraft. Okay. Let's take another break here. Please watch the film entitled, What Caused the Salem Witch Trials? And then come on back. Okay, so you can't figure out who to blame. Let's blame the slave, right? Why not? So the devil's magic, okay? This, this is witchcraft. So 20 were executed, 18 who were women. So eventually the colony admitted that the trials were a mistake, and they actually compensated the families of those convicted. So an early example of reparations. So, so today we have an argument about reparations for, for African Americans for being slaves, for the treatment of Native Americans. Here, here the Puritans are actually doing that. Pretty, pretty amazing story. Since this time, the story of the Salem witch trials has become synonymous with paranoia and injustice. You've heard the word witch hunt. When people overreact and they become paranoid and they rush to judgment, this idea came from these trials. And it continues in our modern and popular imagination more than 300 years later. Donald Trump has been claiming that the Democrats are on a witch hunt to destroy his administration since the day he was elected. But we still hear these, this, this term used in our modern day. So back to the uh, uh, Salem witch trials. Historians have looked back at these trials to try to determine what motivated. There's lots of research being done on this. Was it the poor versus the wealthy, uh, or was it an anti-woman campaign? Okay. 
So all these people, all these different types of new people are coming to the Americas, mostly white people, but from different places, different, different cultures, trying to integrate with Native Americans, two different societies, very different as we've, as we've seen. This began a more than two century conflict between natives and Europeans. And these conflicts happened very early, the, the, the Pequot massacre. Uh, so after some helpful early moments from Native Americans, uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned the, the Thanksgiving and in, in, in teaching them how to how to plant and so on. Uh, but yet they're taking over the native lands and the natives were angry that a faraway leader that they've never seen before. They don't know this person, some king across the Atlantic. They keep awarding our land to colonizers. It's, it's, it's as if we didn't, weren't even here. They're just giving away our land. So the Puritans and the Pequots went to war. This is mostly over the, the anger the Puritans had because of the Pequots' alliance with the Dutch. So in 1637, the Pequot village was massacred. They came in at night quietly and killed 500 people, massacred them, including women and children. They conquered them and took their lands. So I mentioned before, they were, they were benevolent and pure and spiritual on the one, one, side, one hand and absolute killers on the other. So the parents believe that, that the Native American deaths from all the disease was a payback from God that because you're who you are, you're not white like we are. You're not as superior as we are, okay? Uh, they also saw the, 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 the deaths from disease as a sign from God to take over their lands that they were preordained by God to do, according to them, the precursor again to manifest destiny. So the period in Pequot War, later you have what was called Metacom's War or King Philip's War. So Metacom was a, uh, a, a native leader. So he, that was his name, Metacom. The Europeans, the English changed his name to King Philip. Why did they do that? Because that's what they did. I mentioned that before. The English just liked to change Native American names. They didn't ask if they could. They just did it. Uh, so Metacom's watching 1675. You're, you're talking you're 60, 70 years into this, this colonization era. Uh, these Europeans keep coming. Disease is killing many Native Americans. So, so finally, Metacom determined that we, we've got to get rid of these white people. These Europeans must be removed. So interesting about Metacom. Metacom is the son of Massasoit. So Massasoit, who is he? He's the chief of the people that helped the pilgrims at Plymouth in their first winter, this idea of Thanksgiving. Okay, so Thanksgiving, uh, the first Thanksgiving. Of course, this is a very, uh, probably a inaccurate uh visual of what this first Thanksgiving was. It looks like the white people are helping the downtrodden natives, but it wasn't that way. It was the other way. It was the, it was the white people that were near death and the natives helped them, okay? Uh, so, so Metacom is the son of Massasoit who was the chief that helped these people, okay? Uh, so back to Thanksgiving. According to the Library of Congress, Native Americans had had ceremonies for giving thanks long before the fabled 1621 feast in Plymouth that is often heralded as the basis of Thanksgiving. So Thanksgiving is, was not an English idea. It was actually a Native idea. <clears throat> but John Winthrop also had a Thanksgiving feast to celebrate the safe return of a band of heavily armed hunters all colonial volunteers. So the, the, the first Thanksgiving, if you want to call it that, that the colonists had, had nothing to do with their relations with Native Americans. So, so what's the true story here? <clears throat> uh, well, this idea actually, actually was, was born from Abraham Lincoln 240 years later to start to celebrate it as a holiday. It had never been. It had not been celebrated as a holiday until the Civil War, 240 years later. So Lincoln's in the White House, looking at a painting that was probably similar to this, not not the same one, but similar. This idea of these Europeans reaching out to the Native Americans in, in this solidarity, 
and he thought it'd be a great idea to try to bring the country back together that was torn by civil war and to create some nationalism. So that's where the idea of Thanksgiving began, okay? Uh, it, it truly was not what we all think it was that we've been celebrating this this Native and, and European, this Native and English alliance from way back. It, it didn't start until the Civil War. Okay, back to, back to Medicom's war. So with other Native American allies, Medicom went on a rampage and killed women and children, but was finally defeated. Medicom was beheaded, and they put his head on a pole uh, so for all people to see as they entered the town. Uh, if you want to rebel against us, this will happen to you. Okay? But Manicom was able to do much damage before he was defeated. They destroyed one-fifth of all the English towns. They killed 1,000 settlers, but 4,500 natives were also killed, many by disease. <clears throat> Another early incident is Bacon's Rebellion, 1676. This is a revolt against the government and a revolt against the governor, William Berkeley. This is interesting because you're talking about white indentured servants and black slaves coming together, you know, in, in a partnership to fight the, the authority, the English authority in, in uh, Jamestown, okay? Uh, but it was also a fight over high taxes, low prices for tobacco, it was too much of it. It was also about resentment against special privileges given to people that were close to the governor. It was also about the government's failure to defend the frontier against attacks by Native Americans. Bacon and his people felt that they weren't being defended on the frontier. This led to a people's revolt, and Bacon was the leader. And they burnt down uh, most of Jamestown. You see there on the right the image. They killed many Native Americans indiscriminately, and the revolt continued until Bacon died. He died of natural causes in the midst of this. So why is, why is Bacon's rebellion so significant in history? It's not so much of the actual action itself or what the details of the revolt was, or not that it wasn't important on some level, but what's important about Bacon's rebellion is it's the first act of colonial defiance against the leadership, the government, in this case, the governor of, of uh, Virginia, the first act of colonial defiance that lead up to the American Revolution. Of course, that's what the American Revolution will be about, will be, will be the colonists defying the English. This is the first, the first instance of it, okay? So you have these frontier wars as Native Americans were expelled to the fringes of the settlements. Some wanted them pushed out even further European population was growing fast, and, and the Native American population was diminishing. This would be a constant situation that would continue until the late 19th century. Okay, So Bacon's Rebellion, like Medicom's War, remind us that these colonies were an unfinished world still searching for viable foundations. And it really could have gone either way in some cases. Again, if it wasn't for disease, it, it would have been a whole different story. Uh, disease took away the Native Americans' ability to, to fight back, and it ended up the way that it did. But uh, you're still very early in the in the foundation of what would become the United States of America, okay? Okay, that is the end of Chapter 2, Part 2. Thank you.